Welcome everybody and thank you for joining. My name is Juliet Tunstall. I'm the External Events Officer at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, really, really looking forward to today's discussion on energy finance and community business. It's a very timely moment to have a conversation about this as we've, as we've just launched a report on Friday on this topic. And if you saw a couple of slides ago, um, I shared that report and we'll be sharing the link uh, in the chat as well and hearing much more about it as we go through this discussion. So just to let you know, today's event is part of a series which IID hosts called IID Debates. And um, through this series, we, we aim to bring together an international community to have a conversation on key and current sustainable development issues. So I think that is it from me. I'm now gonna hand over to Tabit Mikidadi, who is the program officer for the Green and Inclusive Energy Program at Tangsen. Uh, Tabit is one of our co-moderators today. So very happy to introduce you and to hand over. Oh, thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, welcome everyone to today's event. Uh, my name, as uh, Juliet said, is Tabit Mikidadi, and I'm the Program and Communications Manager at Tangisen. Uh, Tangisen uh, is a short for, for the Tanzania Gender and Sustainable Energy Network, and we are based here in Dar es Salaam. Uh, we are a professional uh, uh, network, uh, mainly advocating for women empowerment and increased access to modern energy technologies and services in Tanzania. So I would like to say a special welcome to the audience based here in Tanzania, uh, Karibu Nisana. And it is my pleasure to be co-moderating this webinar today with my colleague, Sheila Varaucha. And I'm looking forward to our discussion to explore the trends in financing community business using energy in Tanzania and in Sub-Saharan Africa more largely. Um, the findings of this research uh, confirm that access to affordable and reliable energy enables growth of local economies. And demand for energy ensures feasibility of business models for decentralized energy solutions, such as mini grids. IIED and together with, uh, with its research uh, partners in Tanzania found that demand is not necessarily automatic and an important part of the demand stimulation is through productive uses of energy, uh, in short for PUE, uh, which means uh, using energy to increase income and productivity. But when the communities needs additional support to establish uh, these businesses, uh, these uh, productive uses of energy more quickly, for example, uh, financing has been found to be among the key barriers for scaling up uh, productive uses of energy. Furthermore, uh, the other uh, finding shows uh, women especially face additional social cultural barrier that hinders the uptake of uh, productive uses of energy. So uh, to explore some of the key issues today, we have some excellent speakers here uh, with us and I look forward to hearing from them and also to learning from you all audience through the chat and the Q and A. Uh, Please allow me to hand over to my co-moderator uh, to introduce herself and, uh, uh, and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tabit. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our distinguished participants. Uh, my name is uh, Sheila Paracha, and I am the International Coordinator of the Energy International Network on Gender and Sustainable Energy. I'm very pleased to co-moderate this virtual event on energy, finance, and community businesses. Uh, we have an hour uh, for today's discussion, and this will include a scene setting four minute video and a keynote presentation, a panel discussion followed by a Q &A, uh, session with our audience. And finally, we'll end with concluding remarks from Tabit. Uh, to guide our discussion, we have three very esteemed speakers that have many years of experience working on energy access in Tanzania in the context of including fi inclusive financing, market research, social entrepreneurship, and community-based approaches. It's thus my pleasure to, pleasure to introduce you to Fatima uh, Muso, the country director at Solar Sustain Tanzania, Kevin Johnston, a researcher in the Shaping Sustainable Markets Research Group at IIED, uh, Winnie Terry, the executive secretary of the Tanzania Association of Microfinance Institutions. In the interest of time, I've kept the uh, presentations of the bio of the speakers quite short, but please keep an eye on the chat panel as the full bios will be shared um, uh, there as we go through the session. Now, um, to get the ball rolling, um, could I kindly ask uh, Juliet if you could start the video? 
Um, and uh, Kevin, uh, please feel free to uh, start your presentation as soon as the video ends. Juliet, over to you. Tuna mradi ambao tumekuwa tukifanya kwa zama mwaka 2016 ambao ni mradi unaohusiana na matumizi sahihi ya nishati hasa katika kujipatia kipato. Nimeamua kufanya hivi kwa sababu tumeona kuna changamoto nyingi sana zinazotokana kwanza kwa wale watu wanaotengeneza umeme, uh, wale wenye miradi ya umeme, manake tutane mini grid developers ambao wamekuwa wakizalisha umeme mwingi huko vijijini lakini wamekuwa pia na malalamiko kwamba utumiaji wa ule umeme umekuwa ni kidogo sana. Kabla ya kwanza kutumia umeme, kwanza nilikata kwa kutumia muda mwingi. Kwa maana nilikata kwa kutumia msumeno, hivyo ilinitakiwa nikate kwa mkono na nitumia muda mwingi kukata sehemu ambayo ni ndogo. Kwa ujumla kwa hali ya sasa umeme kwa kweli upatikana yake ni mzuri kwa sababu mara nyingine tunaweza tukakata inaweza kupita mwezi hata mwezi mmoja usikatika hata mara moja. Kwa hiyo kwetu sisi kiujumla tuna ni, ni hali iliyo nzuri sana kwa shughuli mbalimbali tunazofanya sisi umeme kwepo mara e, muda wote ni nzuri zaidi. Kuna swala la uelewa. Watu kuelewa kwamba wanaweza kutumia umeme kujipatia kipato. Hilo ni moja. Lakini kuna swala la kuelewa kwamba watu pia wanaweza wakapata mikopo ya kuanzisha biashara ambazo zinatumia umeme. Hiyo ni mbili. Lakini kuna yule uhitaji mkubwa wa watu kuelimishwa kwamba umeme huu wanaona unaosha taa una, unafanya vitu vingi. Unaweza ukautumia ukafanya wewe ukajipatia kipato kwa hali ya juu. Kiki kubwa zaidi imekuwa na kitu tunaita ni maabara yanotembea. Kumbe ni gari lina vifaa ambalo linapita katika kata zote, katika vijiji vyote kuonyesha watu jinsi mimi wanafanya kazi. E, kusema ukweli wananchi wangu wa Matembwe wamenufaika kwa kiwango kikubwa sana na umeme kwa sababu unaangalia sasa hivi watu wanavyojenga nyumba kwa kasi, unaangalia sasa hivi watu ambao wananufaika kwa maana ya ku, ya, ku, ya kuboresha miundo mbinu, e, biashara na vitu vingine kama hivi hapo. We have seen through the years that uh, the electricity, the access to electricity is uh, not enough uh, to boost uh, the development of uh, rural communities. So it is important also to think uh, about uh, uh, to a number of uh, different uh, supporting activities in order to, uh, to make uh, uh, the community effectively uh, use uh, and exploit the electricity for uh, economic and social development. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone. Um, thanks very much to Tabit and Sheila for that introduction. Uh, my name is Kevin Johnstone. I'm a researcher looking at energy access uh, at IAD. I think this video is a great framing for some of the challenges around energy access, especially in rural areas of Tanzania, and really showing energy as an enabler of other sectors, not as an end goal in itself. And financing is certainly a key element uh, of energy access. And this feeds into, well into my presentation, where I'll be highlighting some findings from our recent uh, report, Small Business, Big Energy, looking at financing for productive uses of energy. The report was done through the Energy Change Lab, a joint program of IID and HIVOS. The Energy Change Lab works with pioneers and change makers in Tanzania to build an energy system that is sustainable and people-centered. Working through three themes, energy and jobs, decentralized energy, and accountable energy, the lab does this by developing leaders, incubating prototypes for sector change, building evidence, connecting people, and sharing ideas. This work was done as part of the Productive Uses of Energy workstream. So I'd like to start uh, quickly by defining PUE in its most basic form, using energy to increase income or productivity. Now, there are some technical disagreements in the sector on what constitutes productive use, but for the purposes of this study, we included smaller appliances such as lights 
in the definition of productive and concentrated on electricity. Small businesses and farmers are usually the biggest contributors to jobs and or GDPs in many countries, and this is also true in Tanzania. There are a number, uh, higher numbers of men in businesses with larger numbers of employees, and women typically have fewer employees and are often sole proprietors. Women uh, also uh, often face many socio-cultural barriers to establishing, running, and financing their businesses than men. And in addition, men typically benefit the most from electricity access as they tend to already be in vocations or businesses that are better able to leverage electricity than women. The Energy Change Lab has lots of interests in PUE from Tanzanian stakeholders through our partnerships, uh, energy sector convening and workshops in Tanzania. So what has come out of uh, all this engagement in the sector? Well, we see some recurring uh, questions and themes. So we looked at here how businesses are accessing finance for productive uses of energy. We looked at their perceptions of finance we wanted to understand some success factors uh, in financing for PUE. And for this particular year, uh, what are some impacts of COVID-19? How do we approach uncovering entrepreneurs and farmers' perceptions towards financing? Well, we partnered with six energy companies in Tanzania, and we worked with Geopol, a respected uh, polling company, uh, and administered a phone survey. A total of 722 numbers were collected and 373 completed interviews, so quite a high 52% response rate. Most people we surveyed had diverse income generating activities, so entrepreneurs were also farmers and vice versa. And this is common and makes it a bit tricky to neatly distinguish between the needs of small businesses and farmers. So we asked people to self-identify as either farmers or business owners. As a supplement to the survey, Tabe interviewed 14 stakeholders operating in the finance sector in Tanzania on their views of finance, energy, and productive uses of energy. Thanks again, Tabe, for your great work. So who did we interview? Well, we interviewed just about half and half, 55% businesses and 45% farmers. And our gender split was 76% men, 26% um, women. And given our inherent selection bias and budget constraints, unfortunately, we had little choice on the makeup of our sample. As a consequence, the results should be taken with a bit of a grain of salt and should not be considered representative. Our businesses included about 40% general goods and trade shops. And then other businesses that are typical in many rural areas of Tanzania, carpentry, restaurants, salons, metalworking uh, workshops, and, and so on. The most popular appliance used was lighting. And we also had large numbers of people that used irrigation pumps thanks to the selection bias in our methods, which included a large number of farmers who already were using irrigation pumps. Mobile phones were also quite popular for business and farm use, followed by fridges that were mostly used by restaurants and trade shops. Other appliances included TVs, computers, milling machines, carpentry and metalworking equipment, and so on. Nothing too surprising here. So looking at some of the challenges that came out of our survey, well, we see some reoccurring themes. The first I'd like to point out is the biggest challenge across categories was the perception that interest rates were too high. This could be linked to high number of people that were accessing commercial finance in our survey. Second, I'd like to point out that the lengthy application process for loans was seen as too long. And that means that many entrepreneurs are unable to get the loans when they really need them. Third, unsuitable repayment periods point towards perhaps some structural issues inherent in many village community banks or VCOBAs and some savings and credit cooperative society or SACOs. That loans are not available all the time and must be paid back usually in a couple of months. It also shows that finance institutes themselves are not willing or perhaps not able to offer more flexible financing off, uh, offerings and, and that could be for, for many reasons. So we also looked at reasons for not borrowing for non-borrowers. 
So the biggest one that came out for us was don't need a loan at all. And this is consistent with the motivations of many entrepreneurs in rural Tanzania, that they start businesses not necessarily to grow an idea or a business itself, but simply to look after their family and provide for their family. And this highlights a very important point uh, that financing perhaps is not always the answer. For point two, again, we see that many perceive interest rates as being too high, and this could be simply a perception issue based on insufficient understanding of financial products. And finally, the last but very important piece I'd like to point out is the uncertainty of ability to repay. And this was particularly pronounced with women, where 37% thought so versus men's 14%. And this probably points towards the negative beliefs and perceptions of women towards financing and the extra barriers that they typically face in securing it. Next, we asked, are you planning to purchase an appliance in the next year? And most people said yes, 74%. What are the most popular appliances for the next year? Well, the top appliances, number one was lighting again, number two, irrigation pumps, and three, uh, a fridge or a freezer. And obviously uh, lighting is very useful across different business types. People can work later uh, and work uh, during rainy season, for example, when it's quite dark inside. And fringes can also diversify revenue streams for many types of businesses. For example, we had a carpenter and an ele electronics repair shop who also had fridges um, selling to, uh, cold drinks to customers. And then finally, irrigation pumps are quite useful to most people since many farmers are business owners and many business owners also farm. So how are people going to pay for these future appliances? We asked a multiple choice question on what sources of financing they would most use to buy those appliances. Of the total choices tallied, the most popular was savings at 66.8%. And in fact, if you look at the individual uh, respondents themselves, an overwhelming 80% of people said they wanted to use savings to uh, purchase their, their future uh, uh, appliance. For other popular choices, this drops significantly to around 7% for Vicobas and commercial banks, and then quickly tailed off Sacco's family and friends, and then so on down to mobile money. So looking at reported COVID-19 farmer impacts, large percentages of women and men thought they were selling less than before, before COVID, because of uh, less demand, with many more women thinking so. And a small but significant number of farmers also said they didn't see any change from before, uh, men at 34%, which was quite high. And for businesses, the vast majority believe that sales have decreased with slightly larger proportions of women thinking that. And again, small but significant numbers of businesses thought that there was, there was no change. And this is in contrast to most of the energy providers that we talked to who said, actually demand for electricity is even greater than this time last year and sales had increased. However, this could also be uh, showing some delayed impact on energy providers. For example, if farmers and businesses perceived reduction in that demand that they told us translates into less demand for electricity in the near future. Of those likely to borrow before the pandemic, are they still likely to borrow now? And the answer is yes, they are likely to borrow now. However, about a third actually are less likely to, to borrow for uh, financing productive uses of energy. I'd originally listed all our recommendations from the report here, but 10 minutes is, is a bit short to do that. So I've tried to cram in uh, four significant ones here. Uh, one is listening to what communities need. If people are saying the interest rates are too high, loan tenures are too short, loan applications are too long, then clearly financing needs to be more flexible and streamlined. And that sounds a bit easy to say as a recommendation, but there is the supply there. In Tanzania, there are existing finance opportunities. Let, let's link them better uh, to enable more flexible and affordable financing. So there's already funds, National Social Security Fund, Entrepreneur Empowerment Fund. There's the uh, National Income Generating Program, 
Tanzania Growth Trust, and there are many others. The third point I'd like to touch on is the finan financial instruments themselves, looking at lease financing, which is gathering steam through EFTA and SELFINA, uh, EFTA doing uh, lease financing between 10,000 and 60,000, and SELFINA doing so-called micro-lease financing. But more needs to be done at this lower end uh, to enable more financing um, for communities. So this could in include movable assets registry in Tanzania, better data sharing between financial institutes, and this may require donor support and, and government interventions as well. Our survey had a high selection bias, as I mentioned, and it's more likely that the people we talked to are, uh, already had businesses, had already made investments, they're more educated, have more resources, and so on. So for those households who are unable to secure finance or uh, save over time for productive uses of energy in rural areas, we're going to need more support. So donors and governments must step in with smarter subsidies and comprehensive support programs like BRAC's ultra poor graduate program in order to reach productive uses for all. Finally, I just want to end by emphasizing that access to finance is only one piece of the pie the PUE pie, and in this case, it looks like a key lime PUE pie. There are many other uh, pieces of that pie that are needed to stimulate productive uses of energy, especially in rural communities. But finance is certainly a key lime piece. Thanks very much for your time, and I encourage you to download the new report, Small Business, Big Energy. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that very informative uh, presentation that really sets, uh, uh, gives a good basis for our panel discussion going forward. Um, as you can imagine, because I'm from energy, I was particularly interested in the different gender perspectives that you, that you highlighted. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, from, your, from the figures that you showed that women seem to be more concerned than men about being able to pay back uh, loans. Uh, but I was also, uh, what also struck me is this uh, reliance on savings for growing businesses, uh, which I think for me, that's something that, um, that becomes much more prominent, that people are using on personal savings. And I think that brings a question into, um, uh, into our discussion that I'm hoping our panelists might also speak to, is financing really a supplier demand issue? Um, uh, so thank you very much for that, Kevin. I'd now like to move forward and uh, start with the panel uh, uh, discussion uh, and to hear from the other speakers that we have on their reflections on what we have just heard from Kevin. Um, if you allow me, Fatima, let me start with you. Um, <laughs> uh, Abari Fatima. Um, Solar, Sister, Solar Sister Fatima is uh, very well known for actively promoting women-led businesses. Um, if we pick up from, uh, from some of the points that Kevin made, um, one of the things that he highlighted is the negative perceptions of borrowing that women have. And uh, the fact that, uh, in, in fact, in, in, the, in the survey, he showed that 37% of women who had never borrowed before were uncertain of their ability to repay loans. Uh, Fatma, could you reflect on this, uh, but also maybe uh, look at other challenges that solar sister entrepreneurs see for themselves, as well as for other women-led businesses in the communities where they're selling energy products uh, to different types of customers, but also to community businesses. Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Um, I think as we all understand in Tanzania, many people in rural areas live below the poverty line um, because what they earn is small enough only to sustain their needs and also their income are uh, seasonal. So when it comes to borrowing, they have to think twice. Uh, will I be able to repay this, uh, these debts on, on, on timely basis? Like, and now if we go back to the, to the energy sector, let's say on the pay go system, uh, on the pay go platforms, you see most of them, the repayment of their, of their loans are either on daily basis, weekly basis, or monthly basis. So if uh, a customer or an entrepreneur has a seasonal income, you find that this is a really challenging for them to make a borrowing decision, which uh, they have to think twice on that. 
And I also agree with the Kevin, uh, the concept of borrowing has a negative uh, perception. And this is not only just not coming from nowhere, it's a cultural. People um, get worried and they're afraid of taking risk on borrowing as uh, the perception, especially at the consumer level, they have to think what will the, co what will the community consider me if I take this loan and I fail to repay? what will happen. So this creates fear among the consumers, especially. And this takes long time to the entrepreneurs to convince a customer to accept to access a loan. And uh, going back at the family level, you, you can find um, women, all women, most women at family level, they like the full control of ownership of wealth and collateral. This is the barrier and is the main challenge to many women entrepreneurs and even uh, consumers. As we can see at family levels, women, girls, and uh, children are the, are the ones who bear the challenge of uh, uh, the challenge of energy and the challenge and burden of the energy. And uh, we can see uh, for them to get um, access to loans, they can only get at the small group like uh, Vicobas and uh, circles, as Kevin mentioned, but going back to the uh, to the MFIs uh, like banks, they need to fulfill the loan requirements and criteria. So you find this is the this is the challenge. And at the for the decision making, we can still see um, the decision making at the family level is still male dominated women in order to buy everything, in order to make um, any decision, they need to involve their husband. Men needs to be involved. And this is not just because they are men, no, this is just cultural. So you find this even affects the, the, borrowing, uh, the borrowing criteria um, at the microfinance level because land houses are still dominated by men. And if you go to the attitude, you can see women still lack confidence, both at the entrepreneur's level and at the consumer level. They lack the confidence um, and they don't, they don't still believe it, um, this can be done, or the confidence to try to do something. And um, also we don't have um, enough success stories and uh, testimonies to share with these women and um, consumers um, and consumers in the community so that they can see this is doable. And um, even if you get a loan or you get on credit terms, you'll be able to pay. We have few role models um, at the community levels of which we think uh, we need to improve on that despite of providing the, the support, other support to the women entrepreneurs, which I see this is not only for our women entrepreneurs, this goes even to other women entrepreneurs. And uh, also lack of business skills and uh, training. Most women still lack um, business skills and training. And if they have it, they're still um, grounded. Uh, they lack the knowledge of record keeping, financial management, so you find it's very difficult for them to meet the criteria to access loan. Just imagine for these entrepreneurs who have been receiving training, they get the, they, they, they have the training on the record keeping and financial management. So you can find many organizations that will just train these women and they leave them. So what about coaching? What about mentoring to build the confidence of these women to keep the proper record for them to be able to get access to the loan from the bank. That's the main challenge which we have been experiencing from the, the women entrepreneurs. And we have been emphasizing and uh, um, starting to, I mean, to introduce and uh, continuing to support our mini, women entrepreneurs through mentoring and uh, coaching. Because, uh, and if we go at the customer level, you can see these, uh, these customers, they lack the value proposition of what they buy. So for example, you approach a consumer and you tell them, um, buy this, uh, buy, you can buy this uh, water, for, I mean, you can buy this um, 
what what can I say? A saloon kit, or you can buy, you can get um, That's a nice. sewing machine That's without nice. telling the customer um, on how she she can use that product to generate income. That will be useless, and it will discourage them. They will get they will still get fear to get uh, to get loan for this product since most of them are expensive. Fatima, thank you very much for those uh, for those excellent examples and uh, for really highlighting that um, and bringing in the social culture issues and of course the gender issues and also um, uh, alluding to the solutions to them. For instance, the uh, mentoring literacy training uh, for for women. I think this also speaks to what uh, Kevin's point. Uh, one of his key messages is listening to the customer. Uh, listening to the to for the finance microfinance institutions to listen to the consumers. So Fatima, uh, I'd now like to uh, link the conversation to more global issues. And here I want to bring in the COVID nineteen pandemic, like we had heard from Kevin's first um, uh, from Kevin's presentation. Um, so Fatima, I'm interested, and please keep your response uh, brief <laughs> to this, okay. but I'm interested in, have you seen any impacts of the pandemic on the businesses that Solar Sisters Entrepreneurs uh, are running in rural communities? Yeah, I would say um, the COVID situation in Tanzania is unique and the approach in fighting COVID in Tanzania is different from other parts of the world. Uh, we had only two months of silent lockdown. Businesses were closed and gathering continuing. But what happened, people had uncertainties. However, at individual levels, people took precautions and reduced their spending. And some of the businesses were closed. So in reducing the spending, I would say uh, people, they just prioritized um, like food, health, uh, those are the things which uh, many people prioritize, and uh, you can find on that energy was less prioritized on this, hence affected uh, our business operations and even our entrepreneurs' income. Um, the revenue of the women entrepreneurs fell down by 30% compared to the revenue of the last year. And uh, also, the, I mean, the status of the women entrepreneurs also fell down by 14%. Many entrepreneurs um, dropped off um, during the two months of lockdown before we established the virtual um, training support and sisterhood uh, meeting. So these were most uh, were like were major challenges which we faced, including the import and uh, the import and uh, export and uh, exportation um, challenges and uh, border restriction also affected the supply chain. As I'm speaking. We have some of the popular products which we still don't have since the COVID-19, they disappeared. So you find um, the ones who are mostly affected are the last mile um, communities, entrepreneurs and uh, consumers. But coming back to the positive side of this, um, this has helped us and the women entrepreneurs change our behaviors on what we used to do to what we need to do. Um, especially on the approaches, on the training, on how we do things. Um, for example, on the training, we used, to, we used to do the training in personal, but due to COVID now we have shifted and enabled our entrepreneurs to adapt this model of virtual training through phone calls and, um, and also meeting. So this has been a major change to our entrepreneurs, which we thought it would be really difficult to be before, but now they have adapted it and uh, some of the, of the meeting are still going on virtually. Going to the productivity, yes, it has been helped us um, to reduce some of the costs. Instead of traveling um, to the villages to deliver like a one day training, we can do it um, remotely through phone calls and uh, you find the time has been saved and the cost has been saved. Thank you very much, Fatima, for that. I think, Tabith, you're going to take over. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much, uh, Fatima. I think uh, people now can have a little grasp of actually what really happened, uh, especially in the business sphere during the COVID-19. And of course, as, as, as Fatima said, we had this unique situation here in Tanzania compared to uh, some other countries. So now we are turning to Winnie. 
as in the introductions, Winnie Terry is an executive secretary of Tanzania Microfinance Institutions. And um, she has an extensive uh, experience in the microfinance industry and she has a lot to tell us. So uh, Winnie, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, what our microfinance institutions are already doing to support uh, access to financing of productive uses of energy. And um, how do you see uh, that is evolving in the next year or two? Yes. Thank you, Sabit. Um, what I can say um, in Tanzania, microfinance institutions um, generally, they are the ones who have been um, expanding financial services and products um, for quite some time now. And uh, we all know that microfinance institutions have certain strengths which um, assist them or support them in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the accessing for financial services in Tanzania. They, they are very good with the target group, which uh, normally it's uh, the micro, small, and medium enterprises. They also have um, products and services, which I should say in a way they are sufficient. And they also know the market very well. So what um, we can do is to tap or capitalize into those strengths and um, use it for you know, financing for productive use of energy. Um, but what I can say also is that in the meantime, um, very few microfinance institutions um, have products and services which relate to financing for productive use of energy. And we, we have um, heard from Kevin a number of reasons which um, limit them into um, giving out um, loans for productive use of energy. But I'm quite kind of optimistic that this trend will go upward in the coming years. We at TAMFI, we have a project which we are working closely with a number of microfinance institutions into supporting them so that they see the sense or they see the um, business model into um, giving out loans for productive use or for financing for productive use of energy. Uh, we hope that at the end of this project, which is a two-year project, um, more microfinance institutions will have the appetite um, of engaging themselves into asset financing. Yes, thank you very much, Win. But what do you see is evolving now? Um, you mm -hmm. say that there are very few which are actually doing uh, financing to productive uses of energy, but um, what are they doing and what do you see the trend uh, which is growing? What kind of products, for example, or what kind of, uh, what, what kind of activities are these microfinancing institutions are financing uh, when it's come to productive uses of energy? Yeah, as I've said, I've said that um, very few microfinance institutions are engaged into financing for productive use of energy. Most of the uh, MFIs which are doing um, financing for um, energy, they are doing for um, at a very small scale. And uh, usually it is financing for um, livelihood or you know, home units, lighting, um, lanterns, and um, you know, equipment for charging, you know, phones, their phones, and things like that. Which, in a way, we don't think um, it's for productive use of energy. We would want them to um, include in their portfolios more. And um, and so, I've pointed out the project which we are doing in order to raise, you know, to increase their appetite. Thank you very much, Winnie. Um, mm -hmm. But also, uh, we see uh, different types of financing actually is needed, as you said. Um, for example, now we can see there's a trend growing on lease financing for small appliances. Also, some of the microfinance institutions, for example, EFTA, are doing large equipment lending, for example. And but so tell us, how can uh, microfinance institutions actually better target financing for productive uses? For, productive use equipment, for example, for different types of businesses. Um, uh, in other words, how do we align our incentivized uh, productive uses of energy with the business strategies of the 
macrofinance institutions. Of course, drawing an example from the projects which you're actually doing now. Mm. Yeah, it's very important for microfinances to increase the capacity or build capacity of microfinance institutions into engaging themselves into um, financing for productive use of energy. Um, I'm pointing that again and again, we can tap or we can capitalize in what they have. But um, what I, I am stressing right now in the capacity building, of course, there are issues of product development where microfinance institutions can use that opportunity to see how they can include um, financing for productive use of energy into their portfolios. They, they may use the very, very um, same model which they're using right now, either by um, giving out loans on an individual basis or on group lending. You know, they have these two methodologies. They may use either of these two methodologies in order to make sure that the micro and the small entrepreneurs and end users can benefit um, by using the models. So um, the other way around is to, to incentivize um, microfinance institutions. There are a number of enabling factors which microfinance institutions would need. There are issues of an um, enabling environment. Um, in Tanzania right now, we have the new microfinance act, which um, would somehow reg regulate um, the uh, credit only or non-deposit taking microfinance institutions. They were not being um, regulated before. So they will be subjected to a number of um, um, compliance issues. Uh, with that, um, their, their ability to run businesses may either be impacted positively or negatively, but it may also be an incentive or it may not because we've not yet started working on the new microfinance act. But if, I, if really it works and makes sure that microfinance institutions are being more incentivized by being subjected to the regulations, that means we'll see a big number of microfinance institutions making sure that they open up or they widen their, you know, their way of the way they were running businesses, and they would now, uh, instead of be, of just being um, sticking to the traditional way of lending, they may include other, you know, products and services such as renewable energy products and services, which we are talking about right now. Thank you very much, uh, Winnie, for that, um, uh, for those comments. And I think some of the comments that you have made also speak to the uh, to some of the questions that we have had in the Q and A um, um, uh, chat. Um, and I'd now like to turn to that uh, to give our chance to for our panelists to respond to some of the questions that have been uh, posed by the participants. Uh, like we said, we're going to do this through top voted questions. And uh, so I'm going to look at, there's a lot of competition, but I see uh, from the excellent questions that we have, there are two that are uh, topmost. Uh, I'll start with a question that comes from Doris uh, Agul. Uh, and it says, hi, Kevin, uh, great work. What about the perspective of the financial service providers? And we just heard from Winnie, uh, who is giving the perspective of the financial service providers. So I'm wondering, Winnie, if you could respond to this. Uh, she says, um, uh, I know, oh, what has happened to that question? Oh, I see someone else's thing. She says, I know here in Kenya, some financial service providers try to encourage people to borrow and purchase uh, energy for businesses. Um, I know this question is to Kevin, but I'm wondering, Winnie, if you could, uh, if you might just respond to this. I feel that it speaks to uh, the last point that you made. So maybe if you could just send a few seconds just re-emphasizing that. Winnie, over to you. Yes, um, I see that happening. Um, since we um, we all know that um, when it comes to credit only, that has been some somehow a thing of the past. It has been a common, you know, way of making business with the microfinance institutions. So most in microfinance institutions would want also to try, you know, the other way around of um, making sure that they are. Um, customers also borrow 
you know, product, um, um, energy products and services. But, well, it, as I said in my presentation before, um, most were just borrowing um, home units, things which were not for businesses. And that may, in a way, not be um, a very good way of, um, um, of, uh, of uh, borrowing things which do not really have a productive sense. But when it comes to, let's say, in Tanzania, where agriculture is the mainstay, when somebody borrows a solar pump, and out of that, there is productivity at the other at the end. That means even when it comes to um, repayment, it makes things much, much easier. Winnie, thank you very much for the response. I'm going to go to the next uh, most popular question. And this is from uh, Echo uh, Masters. Uh, Echo says, um, I think this is a question to, Ke uh, to Kevin. Kevin, you're being asked, uh, thanks for the great presentation and research. Uh, Echo is wondering, um, <laughs> Echo is wondering whether the research also sheds more uh, leads on the ability to pay for consumers that will buy products uh, from these businesses. Has, there, um, has that been mentioned as a limitation or risk? Kevin, over to you. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks, Echo, for the question. Um, we've seen that ability to pay can be quite difficult to capture accurately for energy services and products. These businesses that we did survey are typical of rural areas. So the businesses themselves we know have demand from the communities. Um, so it's carpenters making tables and beds, it's restaurants um, giving meals and so on. So there is a, a built-in demand for these services um, already, whether or not there's electricity. So I think the question is uh, the, the investment that the business needs to make in order to leverage that electricity is, you know, is that investment um, there? And although it wasn't part of um, our work, our, our work was more looking at uh, financing the businesses themselves. It is an interesting question to explore a bit more, but from our partnerships in Tanzania, we've seen that um, these businesses, um, for example, in, in the video in Matembwe, um, the demand is there for the services already, and, and electricity really um, enabled a lot of these small businesses to increase their customer base and, and their productivity, and they're doing quite well. And we see that there's, there's actually a lot of investment now coming in uh, in terms of heavier, um, well, in, in a sense, heavier uh, um, industries uh, in terms of tea and, and you know, avocado production, for example, in, in Matembwe. So it's so shortly um, difficult to measure, um, but the demand is already kind of built in. Whereas, you know, when when you're actually supplying an energy service like electricity through a mini grid, um, it can be a, a bit difficult to increase the demand from the businesses themselves. Uh, and I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kevin. I'll go to the last question before I hand over to Tabit to do the closing. And uh, this is a question from Jacob uh, Malki. And uh, Jacob asked uh, Kevin, uh, based on the research, uh, would you say that the dependence from males and the sense of insecurity is the same that we would have seen in the North um, a few years ago? Um, so I think this question is, um, yes, I don't know. Do you understand that question, uh, Kevin? I think you're watching, uh, seeing also the chat function. It's not quite clear to me. I'm wondering mm. if Fatima looks like she might want to answer it. Fatima, do, Fatima would you uh, want to take a, a stab at this question, please? Yeah, I would say that is um, at family level and it's something which is cultural. Like you cannot avoid it whether um, a, woman, um, a woman is financially capable to buy something or to do borrowing and they can, she can repay the loan, but she will need to consult and get approval from her husband. So I think that's something which is cultural and um, uh, to deal with that, I think it's like, you have to change the whole community. You have to change the whole perception. But um, on, a, on the other hand, for the uncertainty for the repayment of the loan, that is for, I would say for the, for the women, and our customers 
who like who are not financially confident, they also lose the confidence in everything. So it's more, we still need to empower women uh, like on the confidence building, um, even though they have small, they can do big. So if we, once they have a confidence um, that uh, I think that uncertainty, which um, she's talking about, maybe it can be also solved. So the confidence, uh, this can be made, um, we can do it, um, let's try it. Um, I think this can also change, um, can reduce that uncertainty to the like lower income levels uh, women, entrepreneurs and customers. Thank you very much, uh, Fatima, for that. Uh, Tabith, let me just consult with you as my co-facilitator. I see that we've got like five minutes to go and you have to do your closing remarks. Um, uh, would you like me to conclude the questions here or? Yeah, I think it's fine if you can conclude the questions, yes. Okay, okay, then I'll just yeah. hand over to you. I think we still have two questions in there and I'll just encourage uh, mm. the panelists to also look at the uh, Q&A and to provide their, uh, to provide their uh, responses um, uh, in the chat function. Thank you. I'm handing over to you, Tabitha. Yes, um, thank you very much, Sheila, and uh, for everyone. And uh, everyone, um, I think we are nearing the end of this uh, excellent conversation. I wish it could go longer, but yes, for the interest of time, um, I think we should uh, almost stop here. But I think we had uh, heard a lot, and a lot of unique things actually came out of this study, and also from our panelists, um, the experience have shown that we we have so, a lot to go. So. Um, I'd like to wrap up with some of the concluding messages that we, first of all, we have had that uh, training and support for stakeholders, uh, that's just women entrepreneurs or any other entrepreneurs, including men and many in these uh, microfinancing institutions. Uh, this is sustaining funding and commitment from donors and the government. And I think this is important because as it has been mentioned that, um, apart from the fact that most of the women entrepreneurs do not have uh, financial management skills, they still don't know how to actually how to approach and actually to engage themselves into financing uh, products, for example, uh, taking loans. But also, as Winnie mentioned, that one of microfinancing institutions they just don't have capacity to to actually develop products which can actually suit different uh, environments, different uh, kind of entrepreneurs. So I think training and support is very 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 important. Um, Another key message is we saw that uh, listening to community needs and constraints is actually vital to building both demand and supply. As Kevin mentioned it has, uh, in the presentation that it's not usually that when people engage in PUE, they want to grow their businesses. It's actually some of them, most of them actually, they just want to sustain their livelihood is not actually growing their businesses to become larger. So uh, listening to community needs actually is very crucial, not only to, to, to that, also, also actually to develop this uh, microfinancing institutions, financial uh, products. So another, and finally, we saw that uh, rural households, um, rural households are unable to access PUE in the real time and needs broader support to enable more uh, inclusive development in rural areas. So um, there's actually more than actually access to productive use of energy. I think there is actually a slow growth until the time of these uh, households are able to actually adopt some of the equipment and likewise actually using those equipment to make money. So before we close, I would like to say a huge thanks to our excellent speakers, uh, Fatma, Kevin, and Winnie uh, for your thoughtful and insightful contribution to this discussion. We've learned a lot and actually it's a very really good uh, starting point actually to dive, in, dive in, this, uh, in, this, in this research. But also I want to thank all participants for joining the webinar, uh, for asking these key questions and actually to contribute into this discussion. Also the team, uh, which has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure this uh, webinar has been successful. And also uh, you will, I think uh, the team will make sure that you receive all, a link to the webinar recording and all the resources that are uh, important so that you can actually learn more about the, this study. I hope we can keep uh, connected and keep this conversation going. Uh, thank you very much. And in Kiswahili, as we say, Asanteni sana. Um, ending over to the moderator. Thank you very much for, for my co-moderator, Sheila, and for the uh, organizing team. Thank you very much.